thank you all very much for coming today. Uh, my name is Fred Bosserman, and I direct the Middle East and North Africa Initiative here at NBN. And um, just by way of a little bit of background, uh, we, we started the MENA Initiative a year and a half ago, kind of with two primary goals in mind. The first was to help build support for a more robust economic engagement agenda for the transition countries in the Middle East and North Africa uh, following you know, the, the, the Arab revolutions that happened in, in 2010. Uh, and you know, many of those revolutions in those countries were really driven uh, primarily initially by underlying economic frustrations and failures. And we thought that kind of without addressing the centrality of those economic issues in those countries, that uh, really addressing the other issues um, you know, uh, were not going to be possible without actually focusing on more inclusive economies um, and, and building on that foundation for other kind of political and security goals. Um, in addition to that, kind of the longer term goal beyond that um, was this mission of helping to articulate a larger strategic framework that really tried to make sense of our policy in that region throughout the Middle East. And um, it's really not enough to just be reactive to events, especially now and looking at all everything that's happening and as quickly as things are developing, um, that we can't just view events as a series of disconnected crises moving from one to the other. And so much of the issue in the discussion around um, around our policy toward China and then the Middle East focuses largely on tactics instead of strategy, uh, especially over the last few years. Um, you know, it's how we structure trade rules. Should we send troops to this country or that country? Um, you know, how do we evaluate cyber threats? So, you know, do we send aid to Egypt? If so, how much and with what types of restrictions? And uh, while those questions are all really important, really when you're looking at the answers to those questions, it doesn't make sense to find answers without understanding of the larger strategic framework that they exist in and what we're actually trying to achieve as far as a regional <coughs> foreign policy. And so I think, uh, especially with yesterday's announcement of uh, new positions for Samantha Power and Susan Rice, it really makes it an important time for us to consider uh, in the foreign policy community what our uh, foreign policy can do in the region and what that can look like. So we believe that the issues that we face really are larger um, than, than a lot of the, the short-sighted uh, and tactical considerations that, that kind of dominate the, the initial media considerations. Um, and that we believe that America has a more ambitious role to play in the world. Uh, in many ways, kind of the most fundamental global conflicts that we see in the coming years and decades, I think, are not simply between things like Sunni and Shia. They're not just between ethnic groups or even things that spring from economic competition directly. But really, the, the one of the fundamental conflicts is going to be between societies that are closed and societies that are open and more liberal and open to ideas and growth and broad-based economic growth uh, and representation for the people. And, uh, and so that's kind of... Uh, what we try and focus on here. We believe that America has a strong tradition, a strong liberal international tradition that's uh, brought a lot of prosperity to a lot of parts of the globe that's focused on these issues about br bringing more openness through freer trade, through more engagement, um, and through development. Uh, and so we think that there's no place in the world really that needs that now more than the Middle East. Um, so as we look forward uh, into the Middle East, we see now there's, uh, I mean, it's a region that has deeply rooted ambivalence toward the West and toward modernity that goes really hand in hand with a long experience under authoritarian governments. And so those things kind of combine in the 20th century that that's really, you know, been changing rapidly now in the 21st to uh, pull out a, a lot of different dynamics, uh, uh, both springing from the, the Arab Spring, but as well as a lot of underlying dynamics associated with globalization and around more openness and around empowering those populations more than they have been in the past. And so that's really one of the reasons, looking at those broader dynamics, that I wanted to convene kind of this series of panels that looks at not only U.S. policy and tactical considerations and what we can do in the region, but also some of the, the bigger forces at work and uh, the roles of other countries like a more influential China uh, in the region and especially around issues of uh, the changing energy dynamics of the region, which I think is an under-discussed issue here in this town. Um, many people don't realize that, you know, by 2035, estimates are roughly 90% of Middle East and North African oil will flow to Asia when, uh, uh, because of surging demand in China and India, huge growth that's not going to stop really anytime soon. Meanwhile, that goes hand in hand with diminished demand, uh, international demand and import demand by the United States. And so when we look at a, re at, at a situation 10, 15 years down the road where, uh, where Asian countries are, make up a much, much larger share of energy trade with the Middle East 
and a, a much smaller reliance on that oil for the United States, um, that's going to be a very different situation. There's going to be a different set of considerations for United States policymakers and for, uh, for Chinese policymakers. And so I think that without understanding how we respond to that, we're not going to be able to make smart decisions about, about policy uh, going forward. Um, it, it, it's our belief that it's important for the U.S. to remain engaged in the Middle East and North Africa for decades to come, that we are going to have interests, strategic interests, economic interests in that region for many, many years and decades to come, even without uh, being overly reliant on extracting and, and purchasing oil from there, that it'll remain important at, and that because of that, we need to kind of act now to broaden that economic engagement to kind of prepare for 10, 15, 20 years from now when we uh, – when our relationship just on extractive oil and, and natural gas is much more limited. So all of that really sets up kind of this conversation as a quick plug. We are going to be releasing a major paper in the next couple of weeks that looks at a lot of these issues and has some policy recommendations for uh, how we can respond effectively to these, these changing dynamics over the next few years. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Uh, you can watch uh, MENA program. Dot org uh, is where that will be made available. And, um, but today we're joined by two expert voices on these issues um, who, and, and I'm not going to rehash their bios, you have their bios in front of you, except to say that um, they're really deep and clear thinkers on a lot of these issues related to Sino-U.S. relations, American energy strategy, uh, and particularly uh, Chinese and U.S. global economic interests and Chinese, uh, the way that Chinese oil interests affect their foreign policy. Um, so it should be a great conversation. We will have quest time for questions from you guys at the end. Um, and so uh, with that, I will go ahead and, um, and tee it off to uh, Dr. Bhagat. Uh, good afternoon, and I'm very glad to be here, and thank you, Brad. And, uh, Probably uh, the first thing I should say, because I uh, I work for Department of Defense, uh, everything I say is only my opinion. I do not speak for U.S. government, do not speak for Department of Defense. Uh, it's kind of, it gets boring to keep saying it uh, over and over, but it is by law I have to say it. Uh, about uh, U.S. Uh, and the Middle East, in light of the new energy outlook. Uh, as you know, uh, in the last two years or so, uh, because of improved technology, United States energy outlook looks very promising, uh, probably than ever. Uh, United States uh, is producing a lot of natural gas and increasing amount of oil and because of this, United States looks uh, will start exporting gas and oil. This raises question many people uh, think about how this improved energy outlook will impact our foreign policy, not only in the Middle East, but with all producers and consumers. Uh, because of time, probably we should focus on the Middle East, and I thought uh, to clarify some, some kind of misperception, and probably I will make it clear from the very beginning what I believe, and it is all speculation because we are talking about what will happen in the next 10, 20 years. My personal belief is uh, not much. U.S. policy will not change. And I apologize, maybe uh, this will not make any headlines. People expect that uh, will, there will be a drastic change. My, my strong belief is uh, it is very unlikely that there will be any major change in U.S. policy in the Middle East. I will explain this. <coughs> First, uh, to clarify some uh, uh, perception or misperception, uh, the, f the first thing I believe we should distinguish between uh, independency and vulnerability. Okay. Uh, since Nixon administration, uh, American presidents have been talking about energy independency. 
and uh, in real life there is no independence in anything why we do not talk about potato independence or carrot independence uh, it is global economy global world we depend on other countries other countries depend on us uh, the word independence has no place in the 21st century or even 20th century uh, I mean, uh, again, maybe it, it sounds good for politicians to talk, and many times in many think tanks here, I hear we do not want to be independent on these evil regimes in the Middle East. Uh, they are not evil, and there is nothing wrong uh, being dependent on other countries and other countries being dependent on us. I mean, probably just look at your car. Uh, there is no American car, Japanese car, different pieces from different countries this is very much uh, our life in the 21st century look at your clothes your home everything is made from different countries and interdependency is good for everybody it makes us understand each other it makes us in peace with each other european union was created on interdependency i hope one day arabs and israelis will become dependent on each other so uh, I do not believe the word energy uh, depend independency means anything does not exist. Uh, vulnerability, I believe, with more oil and gas, more likely United States will be less vulnerable. Uh, less, pro less vulnerable when we have more oil and gas produced here at home we can uh, stand to any blackmailing. It will make us a little bit stronger, but again, uh, it will not make us independent. We do not need to be independent. Another notion is uh, oil for security. Uh, the great majority of Middle Eastern scholars argue that Middle East, US relations with the Middle East, especially Saudi Arabia, is based on they produce oil, give it, us, give it to us at reasonable price, and in return, we guarantee their security. Uh, again, I do not agree with this. Uh, I believe uh, they have interest in producing oil and selling it at reasonable price, because when the price is too high, uh, people will conserve consumption, people will develop other sources of energy. So Saudi Arabia and other oil producing countries produce oil, sell it, because basically this is the only thing they have or the main thing they have. They uh, do not push the prices too high because it is in their best interest. They do not need American pressure to do this. For their security, we are interested in Gulf security because it is in our best interest. We do not do it favor, for, we do not fa do favor for them. It is American interest to uh, ensure security in the Gulf and the rest of the Middle East. Uh, the last point I want to say here, US relations with Middle Eastern countries uh, are multidimensional. There is nothing in life or in policy, you can explain it by only one factor. You cannot explain US Middle Eastern policy only by oil. We have many other interests and I will say a few words about them in a few minutes. But uh, this multidimensional uh, policy, first I will say a few words about energy and then about other aspects. For uh, energy, uh, the Saudi oil minister and other uh, Saudi officials now argue that more American oil might be good to Saudi Arabia. And uh, the first time I heard it, kind of did not believe it, how I mean, more oil means lower prices, like any product, when you produce more, the, pli the prices go down. Their argument, which makes some sense, that in the last few years, many countries, many people have been moving away from oil, investing in renewable resources, nuclear power, 
many people talk about peak oil that we produced all the oil and now production will go down. More American oil, more technology means that oil will remain as main source of energy for longer period of time. More American oil means less investment in alternative energy. So in a sense, at least this was the Saudis say, and again, I believe there is some truth there, that uh, it means their product is in business, in, is in demand. Uh, the other point, uh, it is, we should not talk only about the, the quantity of oil, but also the quality. Something people who do not work in energy uh, do not distinguish between different kinds of oil. The Saudi oil is not of good quality. Most of the Saudi oil is known as heavy oil. The most of the tied oil United States discovered and producing now is of good quality, high quality, sweet oil. And this good, sweet American new oil will not replace the heavy uh, Saudi oil. The last year, United States imported more Saudi oil. American refineries uh, cannot adjust in short period of time. Uh, so to, to some extent, the quality makes difference. Uh, another point, uh, United States till today and for the foreseeable future is the largest global economy. The largest global economy means we have interest that there is no war, there is security, stability, uh, and the global oil market is very well integrated, does not make any difference who buys and who sells. United States as the largest global economy, we have interest that energy as strategic commodity, all countries, China, India, Japan, uh, have access to this uh, fuel. Okay. The last point about energy, uh, it is true that energy is strategic commodity, but also energy is economic commodity. Oil is economic commodity. Uh, American oil companies have the best technology in the world, and they do business in the Gulf, in the Middle East, uh, Oil is not only between governments, but also it is developed, sold in the market by private companies. And because the United States was the first country where oil was discovered, American companies are the leader in technology in everything about oil. The Middle East needs them. They need the Middle East. There is a lot of money between the two sides. Just briefly about the other point, uh, the relations between the United States and uh, the Middle East is not only about oil. Uh, there are other interests. One of them, the United States, is very interested in uh, making peace between Israel and Arab countries. Uh, our Secretary of State is very engaged in making peace and uh, renewing what is called the Arab Peace Initiative. Uh, this is fundamental American goal in the Middle East. Regardless of oil, U.S. will keep pursuing peace in the Middle East. Another thing, counter-terrorism. Uh, United States is interested in uh, preventing terrorist attacks here at home, every place in the world. And uh, again, unlike what I hear in many think tanks here that these are evil regimes, there is a lot of intelligence uh, cooperation between the United States and uh, Middle Eastern countries. We work together. Uh, mean many people here do not want to hear it, but many American lives have been saved because of intelligence information we receive from Saudi Arabia, from uh, Libya, from other Middle Eastern countries. We are in the same boat. There are terrorist attacks against them and against us, and there is very solid intelligence cooperation. Okay. Non-proliferation, 
uh, we are working together to prevent Iran, North Korea, other countries from making the bomb. Uh, the last point, I, I work for Department of Defense, National Defense University. We have many military officers from the Middle East. They get their military education here. We sell them a lot of weapons. Saudi Arabia signed 60 billion D uh, arms deal with United States, United Arab Emirates, 15 billion. This means American jobs. So uh, there is a lot of cooperation between the two sides. The last few points, the last two points I want to make. Uh, my prediction, United States will not turn its back on the Middle East. Uh, as I mentioned, in energy and other areas, uh, we have very close uh, relations. And probably uh, with regard to China, uh, China is importing more oil from the Middle East. So far, as far as I understand, Chinese policy in the region has been driven uh, mostly by economic interest. China is getting more dependent on oil supplies from the Middle East. I believe in the next few years, geopolicy will play a role in Chinese policy. China cannot stay a free rider. China probably will develop strate strategic political interest in the Middle East will take sides. It will not be only economic interest. Thank you. My name is Jennifer Chang, and um, first I I'd like to thank Indian and the New Policy Institute um, for inviting me here. Um, as a PhD student at the University of Maryland, uh, my dissertation focuses on Chinese policies in the Middle East, and um, my segue into um, this topic was to look at um, what role oil plays um, in China's broader relations with the Middle East, and so I will focus my presentation um, on just providing um, of the broader framework for understanding um, China's policies in the Middle East and what role oil plays. Um, so in the past few um, decades, we've seen a lot of media articles and policy reports um, stating that China has returned to the Middle East. Um, and so uh, prior to, and this is on the account of oil because China has um, increased oil interest in the Middle East. But um, I like to kind of highlight um, what was China's role in the Middle East prior to um, the rise of the oil factor. Um, during the Cold War, um, China's involvement in the Middle East was really um, related to um, its perceptions of the security threat from both the Soviet Union and the US. Um, and so China saw the Middle East as this great intermedi intermediary zone um, or a buffer zone between um, China and the West. Um, and China was also um, competing with um, the Soviets for um, communist leadership in the Middle East. Um, so prior to um, the rise of the oil factor, China had um, supported um, several revolutionary um, groups um, and nationalist movements um, and was decidedly pro-Arab in its stance. Um, and um, it was also um, because it was a newly created republic, it was trying to um, gain allies in the third world um, because most of the Western countries did not recognize China to be the um, sole representative of China. Of um, China, it was you know this international recognition was bestowed upon Taiwan. Um, so during that time, um, you know China had established in the 1950s. It started to establish relations with Egypt um, and several other Arab countries, and so. Um, until um, 19, the early 1990s, um, China had not been able to establish relations with um, all of the countries. It wasn't until 1990 um, established relations with um, Saudi Arabia and 92 with Israel. Um, and so one of the continuing legacies of um, the historical relations between China and the Middle East has been um, to isolate Taiwan um, in the process. Um, so I, I just wanted to highlight the broader um, security um, 
interests of China during this time and um, also its other diplomatic goals um, prior to um, the rise of the oil interests. Um, so now in the post-Cold War period, um, especially after China became the net oil importer in 1993, um, much attention has been paid to um, the role of oil um, in Chinese foreign policy and um, a lot of the um, policy reports and uh, media articles tend to emphasize or I, I would think overemphasize the oil factor um, because um, most of them say that they are driving Chinese policies in the Middle East. But if we um, just look at the history of China's relations with the Middle East, um, there's a lot of um, pro-Arab sentiment um, and third world solidarity um, and also um, Chinese um, goals to prevent superpower domination in the Middle East that really transcend this oil factor. Um, so I, I wanted to um, highlight that, um, so currently now more than 50% of um, China's um, total um, oil imports um, come from the Middle East. And in 2011, more than 2.5 billion, a uh, million barrels of oil per day um, came from the Middle East. Now the International Energy um, Agency is predicting by that by 2030, Middle Eastern oil flows to China are expected to reach 10.5 million barrels per day. Um, and China and India are expected to overtake Japan as um, the largest consumers of Middle Eastern oil. So, um, you know, these trends uh, might indicate um, possible shifts in Chinese policy. Um, so I wanted to talk about one perspective um, regarding China's current diplomacy in the region. And um, a lot of analysts um, tend to um, say that um, because of oil, China is aggressively um, courting Iran, um, and other um, rogue regimes, so-called rogue regimes in um, Africa, um, and really defending or, or turning a blind eye to um, human rights abuses and um, other political factors. Um, and this has gotten China into much heat um, in DC. Um, and some of these um, explanations say that um, as China's um, dependency on Middle Eastern oil increases, that there's an expectation that China will become more politically active in the region, um, you know, weighing in on the Arab-Israeli issue, um, and maybe taking a more, um, a more obstructionist role in, um, on Iran um, or on Syria, or the issues that um, are um, considered um, strategic interests for the U.S. So this is where um, there's a lot of um, debate going on on um, whether or not oil will actually um, spur China to um, pursue policies that um, are mutually beneficial for China and its oil um, partners and that might harm um, U.S. interests. Um, but I, um, I want to just take um, the opposite view and say, you know, and, and really ask, is um, oil the real main factor in um, China's more active um, diplomacy in the region? Or are there equally more important non-oil or non-economic factors? Um, and I think it's, um, it's a complex answer. Um, on the one hand, there is a belief among um, Chinese scholars and policy um, people in the policy circles that Oil diplomacy is um, a key part of um, China's overall um, energy security strategy um, internationally. Um, when I visited um, China um, in 2010, 2011, I had talked with several um, Middle Eastern um, uh, Chinese scholars who study the Middle East um, and also um, a few um, people who work on doing energy research within the Chinese government, and um, they pretty much seem to agree that, um, you know, oil diplomacy, Chinese diplomacy should supplement um, China's um, energy strategy in the Middle East. Um, and then there were discussions about um, 
what Chinese scholars perceive were um, failures on um, the part of the U.S. in terms of its Middle Eastern strategy. Um, but it seems that there, this, there is at least, um, you know, some widespread belief that, um, you know, diplomacy is um, an integral part of um, this oil strategy, and um, it, and the belief is that it would help China access, um, get secure access to oil supplies, um, help state-owned oil companies secure a lot of the um, investment projects in the Middle East, and um, possibly send um, more oil to China in case there is some sort of um, contingency or crisis where. Um, the U.S. or some other power um, blocks um, Chinese uh, oil supplies to China. So um, I think there that the belief um, that that um, the belief that diplomacy and um, the expansion of um, just goodwill between the two countries, um, as evidenced by um, a lot of the cultural activities going on, um, there are a lot of um, activities promoting Arab, um, China, um, cultural ties, historical ties, um, and um, even like civilizational dialogues. Um, so a lot of these attempts um, by the Chinese government um, to basically foster good cordial relations with Middle Eastern countries um, can be seen as part of um, China's diplomatic efforts to um, facilitate um, or, or, or to secure its um, energy interests in the region. But um, the problem arises when um, we try to tie the oil factor to Chinese decision making on um, controversial um, regional issues like the Iranian nuclear crisis, like um, other, uh, other regional issues. Um, and um, my belief is that um, we should distinguish between what China can accomplish on a bilateral level versus the multilateral level. And so when I was talking about um, China's old diplomacy with these individual Arab countries, I was talking about um, bilaterally, you know, China's, Chinese leaders can make visits to um, the Middle East, you know, have, you know, official state visits, and um, they can help broker um, direct government-to-government -government oil deals. Um, and possibly secure, you know, some investment projects for its oil companies. But on a multilateral level, when, um, especially when um, we're looking at Chinese decision making in the Security Council, um, it, it's a much more complex picture, and um, there are many more um, factors that come into play than just um, the oil factor alone, um, because there are many more players. First, um, you have um, the U.S. and Russians who. Um, have considerable power and influence over Chinese decision making, um, and um, they really limit um, the types of um, options that China can do. Um, for example, um, if 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 the if Russia and China um, constitute um, the bloc that the anti-Western bloc that opposes, for example, sanctions against Iran, um, but once and if you know, Russia decides after um, intense negotiations with the Western powers that, you know, maybe it will decide to, you know, support sanctions after all. Um, China is really left with no choice but to follow Russia because um, it really um, does not want to be the sole obstacle to um, preventing international cooperation over the Iranian nuclear issue. Um, and um, China really um, does not want to bear the tremendous international cost to its image. Um, um, and because right now China is really trying to cultivate an image of um, being a responsible power that um, adheres to international norms on nonproliferation. Um, and um, given, you know, Iran's behavior and um, not um, abiding by, um, you know, the past Security Council resolutions, um, you know, it really puts China in a difficult position. So to say that just because Iran sends, uh, just because Iranian oil makes up 10% of China's, you know, total um, imports, o oil imports, um, does not mean that, does not necessarily translate into um, Chinese support of um, Iran. Um, 
And so it's a lot of the international pressure that comes um, with um, Chinese decision making in the um, Security Council. Um, and um, the fact that you know China does not want to be isolated, um, even within the Security Council, especially if Russia has made a first move to um, support sanctions against Iran. Um, and um, I also want to say that um, um, my general view is that um, as um, issues in the Middle East become internationalized and politicized, especially by Washington and um, just by the international community, um, China is faces more pressure um, faces more pressure to um, just accommodate Western demands. Um, so um, I think that um, you know the predictions about um, China um, importing more Middle Eastern oil doesn't necessarily mean that um, China will um, necessarily um, do everything in its um, power to you know. Um, be um, to, I guess, um, ignore you know U.S. demands and Western and and just the international pressure um, on certain decisions on the Middle East. So um, I wanted to conclude and say that um, although China's increased activism in the region um, may be amplified by the oil factor, and we might see this in China's oil diplomacy, especially bilateral diplomacy. Um, through various trade agreements or cultural exchanges, um, or um, it might be even um, you know statements um, on political issues, for example, supporting a, a Palestinian state. Um, that may happen on the bilateral level, but when it comes to um, these internationalized issues, like the Iranian nuclear issue, um, like the Arab um, revolutions where China has to um, decide whether or not to support sanctions against some of these regimes. Um, China really has, um, a, a, has a range of interests and, um, and it's really hard to um, pinpoint it down to oil. So, um, and I, I also want to underline the fact that um, a lot of the non oil explanations has to do with um, China's rising status and um, the perception among Chinese policymakers that um, it has more international responsibilities. So um, it, it really can't, even though th there is still some tension between um, this domestic, um, the urge to focus on domestic goals like economics versus trying to exert um, a new leadership model um, regarding um, international issues such as uh, those in the Middle East. Um, so I, I just want to conclude by saying um, bilaterally, I, I would expect to see um, you know, greater um, exchanges between both governments, um, between the Chinese side and the Middle Eastern oil producers. Um, but at the same time, um, I would be hesitant to say that um, oil would be the driving factor of Chinese decision making on um, Middle Eastern issues that are taken up by the Security Council and in other um, multilateral international settings. All right, thank you. People out there, especially analysts who look at Chinese involvement in the Middle East, who have, I think, kind of a rosy view uh, to thinking that their increased oil involvement or their oil interest will lead to them becoming more interested in the underlying political conflicts that are going on in the region. I don't see any uh, evidence that that's actually the case, that if you look at their, their policy of non-interference uh, in their development models with the rest of Africa and other places in the globe, I see that th they're incredibly agnostic toward there, uh, toward the internal policies of the places where they're invested, even if they do have significant interests. And so, and so I think on, on one hand, um, you know, th th there are people who hope that they would play some positive role. I think that that might be a disappointment to them. 
Um, that there are people who think that have these visions of China swooping in and now trying to, you know, have a Camp David Accord in Beijing or whatever. I, I don't think that's likely. Um, but at the same time, I think that, uh, I mean, the criticisms you alluded to about this development in Africa, I think seeing that model exported to the Middle East, especially in these nascent governments who are still kind of trying to figure out the beats and how they uh, arrange their economies and, and their governments, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's probably impactful. And so I guess the, you know, when I, when I look at this and try and roll this forward, I say for those of us who, who care about, um, about the governments in the Middle East, uh, you know, becoming more open, more democratic, for developing, econ you know, economies that are uh, more egalitarian with more widely shared prosperity, all of these things, and recognizing that that's going to sometimes require the international community, whether it's the West, the United States, whoever, to, you know, step in and provide a little bit of guidance. If, if we increasingly leave the table a little bit more and allow China to come in, I see, I, I, I'm afraid that, that that would mean that there is going to be less pressure on, on these relatively young Middle Eastern governments to actually reform if they can just, uh, you know, take, take the money and sell their oil to China, who doesn't really care what they do. So, I'm curious what you guys think about that. <laughs>
And so I actually want to jump in on this. So I, I think that this is all true, right? I think that, um, so, so what we, I guess the question is, should we, should, as a U.S. policymaker, right, if a U.S. policymaker is looking at these trends and looking at uh, China becoming more involved, U.S. becoming less involved, at least from an oil standpoint, and if those people still, for those of us who believe that, that those countries in the Middle East should be more democratic, they should be less authoritarian, that that's an objective good, they should be more open, that we want to see reforms that are positive, and that we have a rising China that is either ambivalent, you know, to those, you know, th those concerns at best, uh, if not openly hostile to those things, you know, and just interested in kind of opposing Western domination, then sh is that something we should be concerned about? I believe here, uh, there are at least three points which we're concerned about. First, uh, <coughs> if Middle Eastern countries will be more democratic or less, to a great extent, it's up to them, United States or China, no, I mean, foreign powers can, can play a role, but at the end, the bottom line, the Egyptians will decide their future, the Iranians, the Syrians, it is not up to China or the United States. We can facilitate, we can play a role, but the bottom line, it is their country, uh, their future, they decide. Another point between United States, China, and the Middle East, I believe it's very important to understand that US and China are not enemies. We are, we are rivals, we, uh, United States pursues its national interest, China does the same, but uh, this interdependency I talk about, US and China are very dependent on each other. So uh, this is why uh, our competition in the Middle East and other regions, it is not zero sum game. Mm -hmm. uh, Sometimes our games are Chinese games. Stability in the Middle East serves the interests of China and the United States and other countries. The third and last point I want to make, uh, U.S. is in much better position than China in terms of soft power. Uh, many people in the Middle East and other countries uh, speak English, understand English. Very few people uh, speak or understand Chinese. American soft power, uh, to some extent, it is understood, less understood than economy or military power, but U.S. soft power is tremendous and it's big asset to American policy. Okay, so I actually want to, um, sure, you know, actually I, I want to follow up on one of those things, and it's also up to you guys, I, I, I promise. So one of the things you said is that it's not zero sum. There, there is, you know, collaboration. And I, and I wonder if you think that there is potentially, if this is an opportunity for more collaboration between the US and China. I know there's been some, um, you know, it's been uneven, but there's been some coordination, some cooperation between Western and Chinese oil companies uh, in Africa, in other parts of Africa, in some parts of the Middle East. And if we see that increasing, is this an opportunity for kind of uh, creating mechanisms for a more collaborative relationship between the two governments, you think? Yeah, uh, probably Iraq is a great example. Uh, most of the Iraqi oil now is developed by Chinese companies for different reasons, but the bottom line, there is more oil in the market, which means the prices are going down here in DC, every place in the world. So uh, like this is a good example that it is not a zero sum game. Mm -hmm. okay. Great, sure. Can you go ahead and identify yourself for everyone, please? Um, I'm from the Embassy of Morocco, but I'm speaking on myself. Mm -hmm. I'd like to congratulate to Dr. Vandiak and Ms. Chan about what they said and the, the presentation. I believe that every country has interests, and China do have interests in the Middle East. If we try to understand the, U, the Chinese stand in the UN regarding the Libyan crisis and the Syrian crisis, we'll understand that there are interests, and, the econ and they are not economic, because the economic interests in the Gulf are much bigger than the business they would do with the Syrians or the Libyans. What they export to Saudi and to the GCC country is way more than what China is doing in terms of business with the Syrians, the Iranians, and us. So this, this is one point. The second point, I think that to understand that we should get a whole picture and we should see China versus India in the Middle East. And we should see also China to let less extend China versus Korea and Japan maybe Australia, to understand this whole e picture. And we, we should see also Middle East and Africa. 
because there is a balance of interest as it comes to for oil and other um, raw materials. And I will stop here. Thank you. Thoughts on any of that? Uh, I believe for sure is a strategic interest. Uh, again, you cannot explain policy by only one factor, oil or economic. Uh, China is a rising power. Uh, there is EU policy determines or plays a role. So uh, I agree with you on that. I actually want, so I want to I want to take that on just just a little bit because I think that while that may be true that but well certainly the uh, the state owned oil companies in China right that they're not you know direct actors of the Chinese government but I think that one of the things we said one of the things that gives them preferential uh, advantages I think in the market is the fact that I don't think they are primarily concerned about profits right one of the aspects of them being state owned is they don't have to they don't have a bunch of shareholders they have to report to, like BP does, like Exxon does, right? And so like one of the reasons why I think you look at they were able to dominate so many of the contracts in Iraq, in, in post-war Iraq, is, I mean, the people, the Iraqi oil ministers even will say that the Chinese were able to take, you know, much more modest contracts, you know, much less profitable contracts, essentially, than Western oil companies. And I think that that's actually an area where them being state-owned does actually have an impact, that they can compete more aggressively because they don't actually have to care as, as much about profits as a play, as, as a, a publicly traded non-state owned oil company that might be competing okay. against. Sure. Right, about the, the grand interests of China. Well taken, yeah, <laughs> true. Okay, well, let's go on to the back here. Yeah, hi, my name is Billy Birdzell. Um, the, um, you know, you meant you talked about uh, stability in the Middle East, um, and stability and status quo are very different. You know, the United States has spent billions and billions of dollars, you know, supporting uh, what were dictators in Egypt, and you know, the, and we we saw that wash away. In uh, Osama bin Laden's 1996 declaration of jihad, he, spe he specifically cites U.S. Uh, intervention during the 91 Gulf War and continued support for Saudi Arabia um, as his justification for jihad, and that was reiterated in the 98 federal indictment against him, and Anwar al in 2010 you know, reiterated the point. So U.S. intervention in the Middle East um, is the raison d'etre of al-Qaeda, which has cost the United States trillions of dollars. 
And so can you please talk about the interest of U.S. You know, security um, in supporting um, the Gulf countries, you know, regardless of how they are characterized, but it nonetheless feeds Al Qaeda's strategic narrative and provides their existence, which you know, they, which with which they recruit people from all over the world, and which the United States then has to deal, especially in light of uh, the recent uh, oil and gas discoveries uh, in the United States, which really can uh, enable the U.S. to no longer buy oil from OPEC countries. Thank you. Very good question and. United States learned the hard way not to support dictators. Uh, as you know, in our history, at one point, we were very close to the Shah of Iran, to other dictators. Uh, so the United States uh, is interested in stability. And as you said, stability is, uh, does not mean just the ruler stays in power forever. Stability, uh, probably the best example uh, for the United States, the trends we would like to see is very much like Turkey. I was in Turkey last week, and uh, Turkey is a democratic country, good friend, stable country because of democracy, because of economic performance, and uh, they disagree with us, but this uh, we expect good friends to disagree. We disagree with Britain, with Australia, with Japan, so uh, this why we are interested in promoting the Turkish model, uh, but uh, unlike President Bush, in President Bush in his second administration had the so-called freedom agenda to promote freedom or democracy in the Middle East, and it, wo it was not exactly the best uh, strategy U.S. had. President Obama does not have this freedom agenda. What I learned working for U.S. government uh, we are still very interested in democracy and promoting democracy, political reform, but a lot of time private diplomacy is better than public diplomacy. It is what I saw, it is better for the United States instead of condemning uh, abuse of human rights in Bahrain, in private to talk to the Saudis, to the Bahrainis, to introduce political reform. And this is in my opinion, is working better than issuing statements condemning ex country or ex royal family. Yeah, it, t Turkey is obviously a, a, a time, timely example for, for stability, I guess, at the moment. But <laughs> it, it, it's still there. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think that you, uh, to your to your larger point, I think that some of that loops back to. Uh, to something you mentioned earlier in your presentation about the idea that really there is no oil independence. I mean, even though w with our, the, 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 the boom in, in domestic production that, that we've seen over the last few years and that we're going to continue to see, I think that we still live in, an, in, a, in a global oil market. And because the oil companies that we go to, I mean, BP, Exxon, all those places are not state-owned, I mean, we, we can't cut ourselves off from, from those things. And so, I mean, if something blows up in the Middle East, if, you know, th there's... Some, if someone clamps down on oil, if there's a huge breakup in problem and in the stability in the flow of global prices, I mean, Exxon's going to just as happily sell their oil, you know, to based on the global market price, you know, anywhere. They, they don't care. And so I think that the, the notion that we can become independent and just, you know, not import oil from OPEC countries, I, I think gives us a false sense of security that we would be independent from, from the region and from what goes on in the region. I don't, I don't think that that's that's going to be a reality that's that's attainable. Cliff. Sure. Morning, Stanley Kober. Um, we are now looking at a major war in the Middle East and what's going on in Syria. Okay? The Syrian war is a proxy war between Saudis and their allies on the one side, the Iranians and their allies Proxy wars sometimes don't remain proxy wars. The Spanish Civil War is a precursor for the Second World War. What if this war is simply a precursor to a larger war in the Gulf between Iran and the Gulf states? What, are, what happens to the energy markets then? What happens to U.S.-China relations?
Just to be brief, I completely agree with your analysis, and uh, there are at least two main differences between what is happening in Syria now and what happened in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Libya. Uh, the first one is uh, in uh, Syria, it is one sect, not one man. In Egypt, the Egyptians uh, overthrew one man, Mubarak, in Libya, Gaddafi. In Syria, it is Alawis. If I were Alawi in Syria, uh, I will fight till the end because it is not only Assad, it is the whole sect. The second big difference between Syria and other Arab countries, exactly as you said, in Syria, it is a regional war. In Egypt, it was not a regional war. In Libya, it was not a regional war. And this is why any uh, solution, any end to the Syrian conflict it has to be some kind of agreement, some kind of compromise between these two sides, Iran and its allies, Saudi Arabia and its allies. Uh, and this probably is a very sad thing about it. It will last much longer. It has already lasted longer than other conflicts. And innocent people, innocent Syrian people will pay the price. Last point I want to make here, I believe President Obama is taking the right approach. In my opinion, it is wrong for the United States to get involved in a regional war, war between Shia and Sunni. Uh, the United States has nothing to gain. It will make the conflict much worse, and uh, I do not see anything good coming out of Syria. I'll just say, I think I'll come around on this question a little bit more uh, than, I, I started, I think, where you are, but I think that, and I think that you're right that we, we don't have a ton to gain for, from getting involved in, in the conflict there, although I think that we do have an awful lot to lose, uh, depending on the way that it goes, and so I think that uh, in so far as we have an interest in it not, in, you know, sucking in a lot of other interests, and it not empowering Iran even more throughout the region in, uh, in it really expanding and destabilizing Lebanon and, and the rest of the region. I think we have a lot to lose depending on how it goes. And so, I mean, the question then becomes how can we act in ways that actually benefit, you know, curtails that, doesn't make it worse, actually maybe makes it a little bit better. That's a, a, a again, a conversation we could have for days and days. Lot, lots of panels on that here. We can, uh, could, could, could go to four of them every day, I think, here in town. But I mean, I, I, so I think that we have a lot to lose even if we don't have a lot to gain. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Benjamin Hornet with the uh, Eurasia Center, and I have a kind of a twofold question for you. Uh, in Africa, as China expanded its presence there, they brought in uh, a lot of Chinese workers to operate their infrastructure projects. Uh, I'm wondering if you see like, a, a similar situation developing in the Middle East as they expand their presence there. Uh, what sort of social and demographic changes do you see occurring in the Middle East as a result of China's increased presence? Great question. 
what happened in, in Africa is less likely to happen in the Middle East for, uh, for different reasons. One of them, first, uh, as you know, there is uh, a kind of resentment of uh, Chinese heavy uh, involvement in Africa. There have been demonstrations against China and some African countries. So I suppose Chinese leaders learned the lesson and they will try to be more sensitive in the future. Second, uh, in many Middle Eastern countries, they are already overpopulated. So, uh, I mean, to a great extent, they do not need foreign labors from China, from other countries, to replace them. So, uh, pr probably the Chinese model in Africa is likely to be adjusted to uh, the Middle East.
I actually think there's a, a, a critically important I issue, especially that, that question you raise, especially for a lot of the, the countries in, in North Africa throughout the Middle East who are facing huge economic and employment issues in particular. And it, it's encouraging to hear that you guys think that um, you know, they would have to reform that model as they expand more economically because uh, I mean, you have countries that have especially youth unemployment that's upwards you know, of 25, 30% in a lot of these countries. And if you were to see uh, a, a growth in, in essentially the model that China's been using in the rest of Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, where I mean, they literally have you know, ships up alongside where they you know, employ Chinese labor that, the, that Chinese companies just seem to be more comfortable with, if you know, for no other reason than that, um, that I think that that would not only fuel domestic resentment in a lot of these countries, but just like, would lead to economic investments that wouldn't benefit the local populations in these countries. And so I think that's something that, um, that we're absolutely right to, to keep an eye on. And so it's, it's encouraging you think that they, that they would have to reform that some. Yeah. Sure. <coughs> um, my name is Spencer Crum. Um, you, uh, you spoke earlier about um, the, uh, the issue of soft power um, and as kind of playing an important role in the, um, the, the rise of China's influence within the Middle East and also the, the United States in its sort of staying power there. So in the, you know, in the last 10, 12 years, you know, certainly um, I think one can say that the, um, the U.S. Um, brand, if you will, has been damaged some um, since then. Soft power has diminished to a degree in the Middle East. But do you see any openings for China to increase its own soft power there? And if so, what are the, the pitfalls that it might risk in that process? And kind of conversely, uh, would, do you think Beijing would uh, risk that in the first place? Yeah. Uh, well, probably a soft power, I mean, one way to measure is how, how many people speak the language. In China, because of one, more than one billion, there are many people who speak Chinese, but they are mostly in China, in one country. But uh, English is much more spoken all over the world. And uh, if you go to any country in the world, you will find somebody who speaks English, will understand Chinese. So uh, it helps the United States, and the United States is uh, trying to take full advantage of this. It makes perfect sense. And not only the language, the American Navy, the American for everything. Uh, China is in disadvantage in this. Uh, I mean, no, no country in the world can compete with the US when it comes to soft power. It is true that uh, our values are, have been uh, hurt by the war in Iraq, by the, the freedom of the Kurds some prisoners. But still, if you go any place in the world, people lo love American people. Many people resent the American government, not only abroad, but even here. But uh, American people, if you go to any, any place in the world and people know you are American, will become friendly with you. This is not the case with China or with any other country in the world, as far as I know.
I think what's interesting when you look at the soft power in the Middle East is that if you, if you actually look at the, the polling that, that comes from inside a lot of these countries in the Middle East and North Africa, and there's actually a lot of uh, so some good survey work that was done at the very end of last year in the first three months of this year, and w when asked uh, kind of what countries, what, what governments they thought were good models, that overwhelmingly what, what came back was Turkey, and you, you alluded to the Turkish model being perhaps a good one, and that's certainly what you see in, in the, the in-country uh, survey data is, is that they they think that Turkey is a good government model, um, even if they like uh, Hollywood films. Uh, at, at the same time, I mean, uh, depending on uh, once you go down the list from there about whether or not it's the United States versus China and others, it depends on the country a lot. Um, but I think that especially in places where um, there isn't a lot of actual Chinese people on the ground, there isn't actually a lot of Chinese presence felt. That I, I get the inclination that. Um, that, that you'll have people who say that they, they, you know, they like China as a model, you know, as you know, maybe their second or third choice or something. But, but the people who say it before the United States, I think that's largely abstract. You know, I mean, what you said, I mean, the, the people who speak English, they actually know, they have associations, both positive and negative, with the United States, where I think that a lot of people in the Middle East who, who if they have positive feelings toward China, it's because they have this impression that, you know, they, they you know, don't have the baggage that the United States does. But I think that, that that doesn't necessarily indicate that if they were to become more involved than they actually were, there was more of a Chinese presence that they would, you know, leap to it and think that it was the greatest thing since sliced kebab. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> sure. Hi, my name is Roy, and I'm from the American Security Project, an intern there. Um, I, my question is particularly about naval power. Um, one, like in soft power, we're trying to fall drastically behind the United States in this area. As a reflection of these vulnerabilities, we've seen an increase um, in ships and ships and diversified the supply lines from naval routes to inland, whether it be Central Asia or whatever, um, through pipelines. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk for a moment about what you see the future of, future for you to see between these two countries in the Middle East, um, North Africa region being, and how that's going to impact inland security. Yeah, because uh, I guess what I meant is that on the first part, it is likely that strategic role because so far the United States has been the main uh, power in securing uh, oil shipments and uh, in the last several years as far as I know China has been investing in uh, building blue uh, water navy basically maybe to go uh, long distance and also I think a few years ago China built the first uh, aircraft carrier so China is moving in this direction, but uh, as we speak now, still the security of the Gulf, the Persian Gulf, security of oil lanes uh, are mainly uh, US responsibility. And last point here, uh, United States is not, I mean, United States is making good money by playing this role uh, because all these uh, weapons we sell to oil companies. I think we're actually going to have to leave it there. So thank you very much. I, you guys may be sticking around. I don't know if you have to go to talk afterwards. But thank you all for coming out today. Obviously, there's a lot more to talk about. We are, again, going to be having a report coming out in the next couple of weeks on a lot of this stuff, the, the, these issues that you guys are obviously keenly uh, interested in. So you can check it out at our website up there. And we hope to hear from you again. Thank you very much for coming.